Did you know many of the Bible's historic sites continue to be discovered today? Join us for more on today's episode of A View from the Wall. Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. I'm Dylan Burroughs here with co-host Joe Kerr. And our guest today serves as provost of the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, and director of excavations for associates for biblical research. He has been a pastor, principal, author, and a sought-after Bible teacher and frequent guest on Christian television and radio. And he joins us today in a very exclusive, unique category of biblical archaeology. We're talking today with Dr. Scott Stripling, and we're excited to have him here on the program. Dr. Stripling, welcome to A View from the Wall. Hey, I'm thrilled to be here. I've been looking forward to it. Well, we have been looking forward to this as well, not just because of the historical research, but because of its significance today as well. We are talking a lot about this place called Shiloh, that if you looked it up in the Bible, we are talking about something that existed during the time of Joshua 3,400 years ago, where many of the things in the book of Joshua took place. The Ark of the Covenant was there for about 400 years. Uh, We have all kinds of information to talk about, so we're going to dive right in, and I know you just reached turned from Israel, where you oversaw some digs across the area, including one at the historic site of Shiloh. Take a moment and tell us a little bit about Shiloh, what's significant about it, and what you've discovered recently. Well, I'm always happy to talk about Shiloh. That's uh, my, my favorite subject. And in fact, one of my favorite Bible verses is Jeremiah seven twelve, which says, go now to Shiloh. So <laughs> Great. that's uh, what we did. We went to Shiloh and we did a winter project, and this is on the hills of three seasons of excavation that we have completed now, and we are exposing the northern slope of the ancient tell that was uh, settled about 1700, 1750 B.C. The Israelites arrived there around 1399 B.C., and what we're exposing is the tabernacle culture there, the material culture that supported the great sacrificial system we were doing a sifting project this winter where we took the old dump piles from the past, we took them through a new technology called wet sifting where we wash the remains. And when we do, it's astounding what has been missed by previous digs. I'm sure you come up with all kinds of wonderful stuff. And as a total archaeology geek, I'm just going to confess, this is a favorite (laughs) subject of mine. So, you are specifically dealing with biblical archaeology. What's the difference between biblical archaeology and just the guy who's an archaeologist in Egypt digging up tombs and things over there? That's a good question. Number one, we're in the land of the Bible. So, I mean, one could be an archaeologist and be doing archaeology in Mesoamerica, for example. So, um, I have no expertise in Mesoamerican or any other type other than what we might call biblical archaeology. And what we're talking about when I say the land of the Bible is the Levant. So that's Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, parts of Syria, parts of Egypt, is that ancient kind of core of the biblical world. And um, when we're excavating, we're taking the Bible as a serious historical document. We study the other literature as well, from Mesopotamia and Egypt and so forth. But we're, we're coming at it presuppositionally that the Bible is a reliable historical document, and that puts us outside the mainstream of, of archaeology. But, you know, that's exactly where I'm comfortable being, because I really do believe that the Bible is a reliable historical document. Well, that's great that you bring that up, because it really leads to where we want to take the conversation next, this idea that archaeology helps support the teachings of the Bible. And if you would, as we're continuing our conversation on this, help us understand some of the major discoveries that have taken place in recent years that help support what the Bible teaches. Well, there have been a lot, as as you've seen in, in the media, uh, but I'll just kind of focus on our work at Shiloh, for example, okay. and how that illuminates the biblical text. We uh, uncovered this last season three horns from a four-horned altar that had been demolished somewhere in antiquity. It appears probably by the Philistines when Shiloh was destroyed. 
so here you have the Bible describing Shiloh as a place of, of cultic significance for the early Israelites for over three centuries. And now we begin to find things that support that, what I would call verisimilitude. In other words, you, you read it in the text, and then you find a consistency in the material culture. Uh, we have also excavated ceramic palm granites there, and the palm granite is a motif of the tabernacle. So uh, the Bible says specifically that the, on the hem of the priest's garments there were bells and palm granites. So as we begin to find palm granites and altar horns and a massive bone deposit with bones only from the biblical sacrificial system and storage rooms full of storage jars where people would have stored their tithes when, or the priests would have stored the tithes of the people when they came to Shiloh. All of this inductively adds up to paint a picture that the Bible is a revival historical text. The bones that you discover for animals, that's significant because Shiloh was a place of sacrifice, so that validates that it was, in fact, sacrifice going on there, right? Exactly. Now, these bones are only animals from the biblical sacrificial system because our zoo archaeologists test all of our bones. We have about 7,000 each season that we excavate, and we know the percentages, and we know what type of animal it was. Now, here's what's sort of mind-boggling. The bones are predominantly from the right side of the animal. Now, without a knowledge of the Bible, what would you do with that? Well, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You would just say, that's weird. We have 100,000 bones, and 60,000 of them for the right side, and 40,000 of them is from the left side. How would you possibly explain that anomaly? But of course, as a Bible reader, you go to Leviticus chapter 7, and you see that the right side of the animal was the priest portion in the sacrifice. And again, that's that big word, verisimilitude. It's matching what you would expect when you read the ancient text. Well, this is a fascinating look at what is taking place at Shiloh. And so many places, both in Shiloh and elsewhere in the land of the Bible, there in Israel and surrounding nations, help affirm the things we see in Scripture. And I think it's significant for those who are listening today to realize the Shiloh location we're talking about is where the Israelites assembled for all of the different worship practices during that time between Joshua's leadership and the time of David, where he brings the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh to Jerusalem. So we're going to talk more about this in a moment when we come back, but stay with us here on A View from the Wall. We'll be right back. From I Am a Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am a Watchman Minute. In 2010, David Crisp was searching for buried treasure with a metal detector near Somerset, England. Suddenly, his device pinged, indicating an object was possibly buried there. He dug and dug, and at first he found one, then two, then three old Roman coins. Day after day, he continued to dig, finally discovering a large vat filled with 52,503 ancient coins. It's one of the greatest finds on record. You know, studying scripture is like searching for buried treasure. If you read fast, you'll find a coin or two, but the real treasure is found by those who dig, study, search, and pray for inspiration and illumination. Visit imawatchman.com for resources that will help you understand and appreciate the treasure that is God's Word. Be bold. Be faithful. Be a watchman. Iamawatchman.com. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. I'm Dylan here with Joe, and we've been talking with Dr. Stripling regarding Shiloh and some of the discoveries made there that are of relevance to us as Christians in terms of looking at the Bible. We also want to talk a little bit about his book, The Trial and the Truth. It's been called an essential guide to every aspect of field archaeology, and I found that true in our look at it. Uh, Tell us a little bit, Dr. Stripling, what will people find if they look at this book that they won't find in other books on archaeology? What I was attempting to do in writing The Trowel and the Truth was to summarize the major findings in the field of biblical archaeology and then to set them in a chronological framework. And so two or three things, really. Number one, can we get our chronology right, the right time, 
Number two, can we get our geography right, the right place? And then number three, can we sort of cohesively take the great themes of the Bible and get a thematic harmony going? So the, the idea is that when the student finishes reading the book, that he or she has a, a flow of the thematic, chronological, and geographical uh, movements within the Bible from an archaeological perspective. And what I'm doing is integrating the biblical text with that along the way. So if someone is already a Bible reader, then then that person should really be able to benefit from the book, because what archaeology does is it comes along and it illuminates the biblical text. It doesn't change it, but it sets it in the culture so that we can understand the, the metaphors and the idioms as they were intended. People are increasingly told, Dr. Stripling, and I'm going to address this, and I, and I know that you have an opinion on it. Um, even in many churches nowadays, people are told that the Bible is just mythology and parables, and you talked about how archaeology is going to validate what the Bible says. But many places people are told, don't take it literally. These are just myths and fables and parables and nice stories. Does right. archaeology help Christians address that argument? It really does, and that stuff makes my blood boil when I hear that, because it's really inaccurate, and that's based on bad information, but, well, the media has loved that. Anytime somebody comes out, like Kathleen Kenyon, for example, in the 1950s uh, at Jericho, claims that archaeology contradicted the Bible. Boy, the, the media just ate that stuff up, but they ignore the, the constant finds that do affirm the biblical text. So um, I, I, welcome to my world is what I would say. That's what we are engaged in, is a, a battle for the Bible. And we're engaged in that arena of ideas that I think is critical for, for Christians to become aware of what's going on so that they can educate themselves, they can pray for those of us who are actually in the field doing that work. We're so glad that you are a Christian who's committed to this type of work. I know that when I was looking at your book, there are all kinds of pictures and images and pieces of evidence that help provide that evidence that we need as believers to show the reason for the hope within us, the reasons for the beliefs that we have, and, and that it's not just myths and fables, but it's something that's rooted in history, and you can still go and see that today. And that's one thing that fascinates me is some of the work that you do. You take groups of people to the land of the Bible there in Israel and help them to have a hands-on experience with what it's like to go through and investigate for themselves some of these sites. Tell us a little bit about what that's like when you take a group over there? Well, it's really fascinating to see the light come on. When people have read the Bible, for example, maybe their whole life, but they've read it in 2D. And uh, maybe I'll put it this way. I'm good friends with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, I talk to them all the time, and <laughs> they're awesome. But as good as they are, they're 2D. When we can then take the fifth gospel, if I may, archaeology, we can then put everything in 3D. Uh, if you could picture the old Wizard of Oz movie, you know, when it went from black and white to color, that's what you get when you then begin to walk the Bible and dig the Bible. It really does make it come alive. We'll give folks a chance at the end to find out more about how they could join you on one of those trips and discuss exactly how they could go about being involved in, uh, well, do you let them carry around dirt and actually participate in the dig? Oh, the volunteers are the ones who find all the cool stuff, and I would welcome all your listeners to contact us. They can just go to digshiloh.org and find all the details there about how to participate. We have a team of professional archaeologists that we, we they conduct a field school, so we train the volunteers, and then they get to work uh, under supervision, and they're the ones that make these amazing discoveries that uh, help us clarify the biblical text. Well, that's a phenomenal opportunity. I know some of those listening will want to check that out. It's digshiloh, S-H-I-L-O-H dot O-R-G. So we do want to encourage you to check that out as well. We'll mention that again at the end of the program. But this isn't just about the past. It's about the present as well. I know that there are political issues related to some of the sites that you go to. What are some of the barriers mm -hmm. perhaps that you're facing when you're doing this type of work? Well, we've been uh, excavating in what some people would call the West Bank, or mm -hmm. Judea Samaria, or Area C. <laughs> Each one of those has its own political connotations for uh, 40 years now, so we're very aware of those geopolitical realities. Um, you know, we really are apolitical. We're, we're there to, to 
try to be a light to do excellent work and to to be able to excavate. But along the way, of course, we unfortunately cannot avoid politics. They they follow us. Um, I've been sued by groups who are trying to shut down our dig because of you know their various political reasons. Um, we have also been blamed for the conflict in the Middle East because we're finding things that prove that the Bible is a reliable historical document. And so whatever you do in that part of the world has political uh, ramifications. But I do my best not to get entangled in it. Right. Well, it's certainly something you cannot avoid being in that land. But at the same time, your goal is to simply go to these sites to see what you can find and to share those discoveries with others. Now, when you come back and you have opportunities to speak, whether it's on radio or to church or on a campus at a school, what are some of the things you like to highlight to say, this is why what I do is so important? Give us a little bit of that motivation that keeps you going out there again and again. Well, I like to do what I call faith lessons. And so we're looking at things that people may read the biblical text but not fully grasp it. And I'll share one quick example with you. Uh, read Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who has turned his heart away from God. He will be like a, a bush or a shrub or a tree in, in the desert. Well, what does that really mean? Uh, when we look deeper in the language, the Hebrew word is arara. A-R-A-R-A, and and Arara is a specific type of plant that grows in that part of the world, and it produces a beautiful fruit, which happens to be poisonous, and it will kill you. So it looks beautiful on the outside, but on the inside it's full of poison. So read the text again, Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who has turned his heart away from God. He will be like an Arara in the desert. Ah, now it comes into focus. Uh, I may look like I've got it all together, but if my heart's not right with God, then then there's really poison on the inside of me. So we just have hundreds of examples like that one of how archaeology and historical and geographical studies illuminate the biblical text. Oh, that's fascinating. Joe, I know that you just had a chance to go to Israel, and it's one thing to be able to be in the land of the Bible. It's quite another to have your hands digging in the dirt and to be able to go through it like you do on a regular basis during your trips there and to be able to come back and share some of those insights with others. And that's what I hope we're doing with our listeners today. And we'll be right back in a moment with more on A View from the Wall. The rapture can happen at any time. You may be ready, but are your friends and family spiritually prepared for the coming of the Lord? What will happen to those left behind? We've created a new resource to help you help them. It's called the Rapture Kit. Included in the Rapture Kit is a Bible and vital information on what the rapture is and how to prepare for what's to come. The Rapture Kit also includes eight books on prophecy, apologetics, the Christian walk, and being a watchman for the Lord, plus a number of video and audio teachings all preloaded on an eight gigabyte flash drive. Become more strategic and active in your witnessing. Warn the lost about the coming rapture and help individuals in the post-rapture world be drawn to Christ, equipping them to become the next generation of ministry leaders. Learn more and order at rapturekit.org. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. We're joined today with Dr. Scott Stripling, and we are talking about excavation, archaeology, biblical finds in the land of Israel. Our Watchman audience, Dr. Stripling, loves Israel because they believe what the Bible says, that God gave the land to the Jews many thousands of years ago, and he chose it as a place to put his name there. Now, that's disputed in the UN and elsewhere. Does archaeology validate that Israel is, in fact, the rightful owner of that land? Well, as an archaeologist, I can just say that we have evidence of an ancient and historic Jewish presence there. Um, for example, when we are at uh, Shiloh, where we're excavating now, we have a, a an animal bone percentage that is about 4% pig bone in the, the Canaanite level. 
So when we move into the next occupational strata, which the Bible then assigns to the Israelites, it drops below 1%. Well, that's a measurable, quantifiable change. Uh, when we move forward in history, we find other indicators like collard room jars and stone vessels and, and baptismal tanks that we would call mikvot. Um, all of these things are clearly a Jewish uh, presence. So we can, for, for certain, to say that there was an ancient Jewish presence uh, in the land of the Bible. Well, that's one good way to go about showing the historic connections between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. It's interesting that many of these that you talk about in Shiloh go back as far as 3,400 years ago, approximately, where this was a key place of worship until the time of David. For those who may not be as familiar with the Old Testament story, when Moses and the Israelites were in the wilderness, they crossed the Jordan River into the land of Israel as we know it today under the leadership of Joshua. When Joshua was there. Shiloh became the place where the ark stayed, where the tabernacle was, where the people worshipped and did their mm-hmm. sacrifices. And it's remained that way up through the time of Samuel. And at the time of Samuel, he anoints first King Saul and then also King David. And David is the one who helps bring Jerusalem into the land of Israel and under his leadership. And it's during his lifetime that we see the Ark of the Covenant go from Shiloh to Jerusalem, which becomes the capital for a period of now 3,000 years since that time. So we see so many connections between what Dr. Stripling has been doing in the land of Shiloh with Jerusalem, with events today politically that are going on, some of the controversies regarding Jerusalem itself, even the Temple Mount. So a lot that's taking place here. And as we look at this from a prophecy perspective, you can see that the work that's being done by Dr. Stripling and others helps to authenticate the presence of Jewish people in the land, helps to authenticate some of the things in the Bible that we see today, and gives us many fascinating ways that we can talk about our faith with those who may be skeptical otherwise. And I think as we continue our discussion in this last segment, Dr. Stripling, when you talk to people who are skeptical about the findings of the Bible and say it's all a bunch of bias uh, from those who really are trying to just prove a particular standpoint. What are some of the ways that you address that using the evidence that you have? Well, I would first of all say that that's a, a very biased view that anyone would have, that just because I happen to be coming from a faith perspective that I can't be scientific, Correct. that's ridiculous. Um, we, we have the highest level of scrutiny in our uh, material remains that uh, I think is beyond question. So when I hear someone say something like that, they just clearly don't know the type of work that uh, we're doing. Uh, there was a, a newspaper in Israel last year that ran a story, and it was kind of humorous. They said that while Stripling and his team lie outside the mainstream of Israeli archaeology in that they take the Bible as a serious historical document, he does rigorous scientific archaeology. And I thought, okay, well, there's three accusations there, and I'm guilty on all three, okay? <laughs> We're guilty of doing rigorous scientific archaeology. We're guilty of being outside the mainstream, and we're guilty of taking the Bible as a serious historical document. All I've ever wanted uh, was to be engaged in the arena of ideas, and we are. And I want to be able to take our evidence, which happens to match the Bible, and I'm very comfortable discussing that and putting the evidence out there to juxtapose it so that we can mix it up and and learn from each other as we go. But uh, the anti-biblical bias, I'm... uh, not happy about that, and I'm always glad to push back when I get a chance. All right. Dr. Stripling, we'd like to conclude each of our programs with a word of encouragement and challenge for our watchmen and women who stand on the front lines. Watch, warn, witness, and work to finish well, according to what the Bible says. What lessons from archaeology would encourage and challenge our watchmen? Well, there are a lot, but I mean, the name of your broadcast with the word wall in it, I think is significant also, because we've excavated hundreds of walls, you know, very large walls, very small walls, but um, these walls are built on bedrock, and when we excavate all the way down, we excavate the bedrock, and what do we find? The walls that are standing are the ones that are built on bedrock, and we remember, of course, what Jesus said, that the wise man builds on the rock, and... uh, we learn a lot from, from archaeology as, as we're digging, digging the Bible. We're learning just 
faith lessons are popping out at us all the time. So I would encourage your, your listeners to, as they read their Bible, to also introduce some archaeological insights. Uh, they can get our magazine, which is called Bible and Spade, from Associates for Biblical Research, from our website, BibleArchaeology.org, and just begin to, to let these, these two communicate with each other. God left us an incredible witness of the past. Uh, the scriptures are a very specific revelation from God. But we have the general revelation in nature and in the material culture that's left behind. And as we study that, we just really see how great our God is. Well, that's so well said. And I think of many religious movements that really lack that historical background when it comes to evidence for their faith. But it in my mind, strengthens the case for Christianity, the case for my faith in Jesus Christ. When I can look at the evidence that you and many others have devoted your lives to discovering and sharing in a way that no other movement can compare with. Uh, As I wrap up our time together with you today, I want to encourage people to get some more information about your work. Again, you mentioned digshiloh.org is a place for people who may be interested in having a hands-on experience there in Shiloh and doing some archaeological work as a volunteer. You also mentioned BibleArchaeology.org is a place where people can go and get more information about you, the work you do, as well as get a copy of your magazine. And then tell us a little bit again about your book and how we can get a copy of that for those who want to. Absolutely. And then my personal website is scottstripling.net, and so they can always go there and find information about my book and how to acquire it. Um, We have a new book coming out uh, later this year as well, Uh, Five Views of the Exodus. I wrote the first chapter in that for the biblical date of the Exodus, and so I would encourage folks to keep an eye out for that from Zondervan later this year. And um, and then search YouTube and Google and, you know, all those channels that are out there today that uh, have all this cool information that people can access. Uh, we're, We're excited to be doing what we're doing and welcome anybody to join with us. Great. And those of you who may be listening on the radio and aren't online at this time, please go to IamAWatchman.com as you see all the information below this episode that will take you to the links that we've mentioned. Well, Dr. Stripling, we appreciate you being with us, and we thank you so much for your time here with us on A View from the Wall. It's been a real joy. God bless you. Well, thank you. And again, those of you listening today, we appreciate you and your commitment to biblical truth and to knowing about the end times and communicating that to others. We hope you've been encouraged by today's program. I encourage you to find out more at IamAWatchman.com. We look forward to being with you next time here on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening, and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.